Okay, so two different sort of interpretive strategies here that Hobbes might be proposing either a moral solution to state of nature, change in our internal reasoning and values, or merely a political solution where it's simply a matter of the incentives and threats being changed. Yeah. You have changed the question.
so this, the way to do this is to give up your right of nature on the condition that other people do so as well. Because you doing it unilaterally would be to make yourself pray. That's not going to achieve peace. So all of these other laws of nature, from more or less three on, which tell us how to do that, all of these are, in a sense, conditional. All of these say, do these things assuming that other people do so as well, on the condition that other people do so as well. So if literally you're the only one keeping your covenants, following the third law of nature, and nobody else is doing it, as an aside, this would be irrational for everybody else. But assume that they're being irrational, well, you don't have to either. Okay. And so, at the end here, Hobbes says, paragraph 36, the laws of nature oblige, he says, in foro interna. That is to say, they bind to a desire that they should take place. It's rational for us all to want these laws of nature to be implemented. But, he says, in foro externo, that is, to the putting them in act, not always. So, we always do what these laws of nature say, from the third on, is that we should have, it's rational for us to have a desire to achieve the conditions in which these get implemented. It's rational to have that desire. But, unless everybody else is willing to do this also, we don't have to put these into practice through our actions. We, what's required, what's rationally required, is that we have a desire to achieve the circumstances in which we would act on. Interno means having a desire for the conditions that would allow everybody to act. So we all, what's required of us is that we all, as it were, internally want these to be but we don't have to act on them unconditionally. The act that is external. Okay, and now we come to the end over on 100, where we um, get a kind of summary of this argument, paragraph 40. What we've been doing here, he says, um, is moral philosophy. What we've been doing here is a science of, that is, an objective account of morality. For moral philosophy is nothing else but the science of what is good and evil in the conversation and society of mankind. Remember, he says, good and evil are names that signify our appetites and aversions, which in different tempers, customs, and doctrines of men are different. And in fact, diverse men differ not only in their judgment on the senses of what is pleasant and unpleasant to the taste, but also what is comfortable and disagreeable to reason in the actions of common life. In fact, he says, Nay, the same man in diverse times differs from himself, and one time praiseth, that is, calls good, what another time he dis, dis, dispraiseth, that is, calls evil. So our desires, and therefore what we value, changes and, dis, and, and differs from one person to another. From whence arise disputes, controversies, and at last war. There's no way to make assessments objectively, and we simply rely on the desires that we happen to have to make evaluation. And therefore, so long as um, so long a man is in the condition of mere nature, which remember is a condition of war, as private appetite is the measure of good and evil, as long as we're relying on the desires that we happen to have to decide what's good and bad. And consequently, all men agree on this, he says, that peace is good. And therefore, also the way or means of peace, which I've just been arguing includes justice, gratitude, modesty, equity, mercy, and the rest of the laws of nature, they are good. 
That is to say, our moral virtues and their contrary vices evil. So the argument has been what I've been trying to show, that from a basis of subjective evaluation, Hobbes argues that if we simply rely on our own subjective evaluations, we would be in a condition of war of all against all, where nobody would be able to get what they wanted. Everybody would agree that this would be evil or bad. And therefore, there are objective rules, instrumental rules, instrumental laws to tell us how to avoid that situation. And given the fact that that situation is bad for everybody, everybody has a reason to follow these laws. That's how to justify moral rules. That's how we justify moral standards. OK, um, so I want to go through very, very quickly uh, chapter 16, because the, here there's just really some vocabulary that we need um, to start on uh, Monday with part two. Um, so here, real quick, um, person and author. Um, so a person is somebody who acts or speaks. A person, he says, is he whose words or actions are considered either as his own or is representing the words and actions of another. So someone who acts or speaks. And these can be either, these persons who act or speak, can be either a natural person or an artificial person. So a natural person is just a human being. An artificial person is something that acts or speaks and is therefore a person. And acting or speaking, Hobbes says this is the actor. But the person who's responsible for the action or speaking in the, it, it is what Hobbes calls the author. Okay, so um, in the simplest case of a natural human being, we are both the actor and the author. We act in a certain way and are responsible for our own actions. In the case of, I don't know, a robot that's being controlled by someone else, maybe this is an artificial person because it's acting, but the person responsible for what it's doing is the author, is the responsible. Another example of this is if we authorize somebody to act in our name, should be thinking maybe like the power of attorney. When I authorize you to sign my checks for me, you are the actor, I'm the author. I'm responsible for the actions that you perform. Clear? Okay, and lastly, very simply, Hobbes thinks that it's possible for multiple individuals, multiple persons, to authorize the same actor. In that case, we all become responsible, all us authors, become responsible for the action of that individual. Their action is our action. That's what it means to authorize. So when I tell them, when I give power of attorney to somebody, their action is mine. I'm responsible. And so if we all authorize the same individual, that action by that actor is something we are all the authors of. Clear? OK, so um, for Monday, read through uh, the end of chapter 20. Um, that's page 131.